Hello, and welcome to Controversies in Church History, the podcast that takes you through the most interesting and controversial episodes in the long history of the Roman Catholic Church. My name is Derek Taylor. I am the host for this podcast. Welcome to everyone. Thank you to all our listeners. We really appreciate you out there. Uh, thank you to everyone who's listening for the first time. Welcome. If this is your first time, uh, this is how things go. I usually introduce the podcast this way and let people know you can find Controversies in Church History on the web at churchcontroversies.com. I have a blog there where I, po- which I, where I will post original content occasionally, link to other things that I write for other Catholic publications. I also, um, you can also find the podcast on, on social media, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube. I'm up, currently updating the episodes I have on YouTube. I haven't put the latest ones on there. I'm getting around to it. And then uh, also I have a Patreon account. So if you like to become a patron of the podcast, help defray you know expenses like advertising and stuff like that, um, you can do that. There is no, I don't make money off this. This is free. It will be free. Almost all the um, episodes you can find on Spotify for podcasters, which were, which is the host for the podcast, pretty much anywhere else you listen. Um, uh, the uh, bonus you get for being a patron is uh, no ads, bonus episodes, stuff like that. So, but uh, pretty much everything will eventually be made available free, but you get that stuff earlier and have access to it. So, but now that all that's out of the way, welcome again back to our series on Latinization. And uh, this time, last time we had left off on Latinization in the Ottoman world. And this is episode five, Rome and the Church of the East, 1450 to 1800. So just to recap, what we're talking about, you know, with um, you know the, the whole larger issue of what this series is about is, you know, did the Church of Rome try to impose its customs and uh, liturgical, ecclesiastical on Eastern churches that came into communion with it after the Great Schism in 1050? And we talked about before this, you know, how the end of the Byzantine Empire kind of shape, reshaped things because there was no longer a sort of parallel, you know, claim being made, or at least it couldn't be made as forcefully claimed a universal authority compared to Rome's after this, but how this changes in the early modern period. The early modern period is where things changes because of the Reformation. Rome had been pushing for centuries claims to jurisdiction over the entire church, but the Reformation alters this out of all proportion because it's challenged by the, by the Protestant reformers, and so the Council of Trent will reiterate this. This will have a definite effect on how uh, Rome views those Eastern churches not in communion with it, but also the ones that come into communion um, because they tended to care more about jurisdictional you know, authority, obedience to Rome than Eastern customs. And Rome was, generally speaking, uh, scrupulous about defending ancient rights. Um, uh, and, and in principle, they pretty much always have. I'll give Rome credit for that. You have to give Rome, if you're an Eastern Orthodox, you have to say they, in principle, did this. In uh, practice, it's different uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that wherever there was a question of Orthodoxy about those rights, Rome felt free to intervene and did and would make changes. The second part of this is more complicated, and we'll get into this as we go along. We've already dealt with some of this in the last episode, is that if representatives of Rome on the ground sometimes impose Latinization without really being in, it being Rome's direct command or it being its direct at fault for this. And that's, I think, actually a bigger problem in the long run until you get to the modern era. Even then, as we'll get to that uh, eventually, <laughs> we'll get to the modern era, the only early modern period here. So what is the Church of the East? And I'm, I'm talking, I'm assuming most of my listeners are, in fact, um, Latin Rite Catholics, probably on the traditionalist side. So let me explain what the Church of the East was. And the Church of the East is, historically speaking, the, the Christian church that emerged within the boundaries of the Persian Empire in, the, in late antiquity. We're talking about the Sasanian Empire. It was like 225 or so to about 630 until it was conquered by the Arabs. And the church there gradually became assimilated to that culture. So its eastern origins are Persian. Its major centers were in places like I'd never heard of, Nisibis and Edessa. Uh, and so it had, it's sort of outside the, you know, major, we think of the major centers as being Constantinople, Rome, and then you have the, the so-called Pentarchy, you know, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem to go along with them. But um, these, this church grew 
outside of the uh, outside of the Roman Empire. And it's important because in 431, the Council of Ephesus, if you don't know what the Council of Ephesus did, uh, it defined uh, Mary as Theotokos, right, the mother of God, and it rejected the teaching of the bishop Nestorius, um, who basically claimed that uh, Christ had was both a divine and human person, two persons and two natures, right? Which, of course, the Council of, um, I pronounce it, Chalcedon, Chalcedon, 20 years later in 451, the formula for orthodoxy elsewhere, for, for orthodoxy, as, you're, as far as you're concerned as a, a Catholic, is that he has one divine person, but two, hum, two natures, human and divine. And so, and so Nestorius rejected that. He also rejected that title, uh, Mother of God, for Mary. And the Church of the East is the descendant of, of this church. Now, I have to um, stop here, and again, I probably have a lot of traditionalist Latin Rite Catholics listening to this. The reason why I'm calling it the Church of the East is because it's a less offensive term than Nestorians, right? And this is, again, this is a heresy. It is. It's, as you're going to see, it's the major reason that the Church of the East is not in communion with Rome at this point. Um, I'm talking about the Church of the East, Church of the East that's not in communion. There is a part that breaks away, and we'll get to them in a second. That's what we'll talk about here. But I'm calling it the Church of the East because that's its origins. That's its ancient um, pedigree. And uh, I should stress, because again, you know, um, this is not the same. Right? You should not view the Church of the East as the same as, say, Protestantism. Um, yes, they reject a major, major piece of, of, of uh, Orthodox Christology, major piece of, of Mariology, big deal. Otherwise, it is very much the ancient faith, more or less, that the Church East hands on. Um, and its antiquity, uh, and in both its pedigree, makes a big difference to Rome, as you'll see in historical terms. And part of the reason why is the Church of the East, even after 431, flourishes. Um, partly because it can't be condemned because it's outside the Roman Empire. So uh, Constantinople can't do anything about it. And um, it particularly is very successful in missionary work. The Church of the East in the 5th, 6th, 7th uh, centuries sends missionaries, and it will spread, uh, you can call it Nestorian Christianity if you want, to China and India, starting in the late 5th century. 5th century. Um, for many centuries, until the 11th century, basically, the Church of the East was actually the largest um, what was the largest church in terms of its you know, jurisdiction in the entire world, stretching from uh, basically all the way to, you know, effectively, to Egypt, all the way to the, the Pacific Ocean, the, the, the shores of, of China. Uh, and so it was a humongoloid. If you ever look at a map of it, it's a huge, huge church, basically. What happens is after the year 1000, it begins to decline for a variety of reasons. Uh, there are um, reasons for this. Partly it's because of the Mongol invasions of the uh, 13th century. They wreck Christianity in Central Asia. And, of course, the um, uh, Mongol leaders become, become uh, Muslims themselves. They begin persecuting Christianity to a certain degree. Uh, the last of these Turkic, Turkic invasions of, of, uh, of Western Asia, the, um, Timur, Timur the Long, the Timurid Empire, comes to power in the 1370s, um, and he, of course, comes into Central Asia. He basically annihilates Christianity in Central Asia. So until the 1350s, you have a presence in Central Asia, which would have been, this would have been Christianity to them. Um, and so the, the, the main body remaining from that era is actually in India, which we're going to get to next time on the next episode, because it's, it's the most controversial, it's the most obvious case of Latinization in the early modern period. Um, but what we call the church, we'll call the Church of the East, and call it the Assyrian Church today. Again, the one not in communion with Rome. Uh, I'll give you the term for the one in communion with Rome in a second. Um, it basically exists, except for again um, the Indian situation, which we'll get to next time. Basically, stretches today, uh, sort of triangle from, on modern maps from northern Iraq, uh, Mosul is the main place, but southeastern Turkey to. Um, um, northwestern Syria, or northern Syria, I should say, and then um, the very fringes of northwestern Iran. That's basically where most of these Assyrian Christians are today. And in terms of the, the, this relationship, this church is still in existence, um, I'm calling the Church of the East, uh, encompasses you know these Christians. And there are other places, by the way. There are uh, pockets of them in Cyprus, Jerusalem, other places in the Middle East, mostly in Iraq, 
Uh, their rite, by the way, is a Syriac rite, so it's a Syriac language. Um, Aramaic, basically, um, in, uh, in terms of their rite. And um, this is known as the Assyrian Church of the East. This is how you call them. The church that is, communi- is in communion with Rome today is called the Chaldean Catholic Church, and we're going to talk about how this comes about in this episode. There are also uh, churches in India. Um, I'll get to this in a moment. But basically, a two two different rites: the Syro Malabar and the Syro Malankar. There are both two churches in, in communion with Rome and out of communion with Rome in India. I'll get to that next time. Uh, but the modern relationship between the Catholic Church and the Assyrian Church of the East is very good since the 1980s. They they came back into communication with each other since the disastrous uh, invasion of Iraq by the United States government in 2003. Um, you know, the Catholic Church has tried to help out with, with those uh, Assyrian Christians there. So they have had pretty good <coughs> relationships. They are still not in communion. The reasons of what I mentioned earlier, um, the doctrines of Nestorius, the idea of, of Christ as having one rather than two persons, and the denial of the, uh, of the, do- of the title of Theodokos for Mary. Huge things, which is why it hasn't happened. And yet, as you're going to see in this episode, it's been a long time, uh, been in contact for many centuries. And the first contact and we're talking about here begins in the, actually, again, with the Crusades in the uh, 13th century. You have the first contact between the Patriarch of the Church of the East and Rome, probably in the 1240s, um, when Rome sends messages to the Patriarch, possibly about seeking communion. Uh, and there's a few times when there briefly might have been some communion, nothing came of it. A letter was sent by the Patriarch uh, Yahab, uh, Balaha in 1304 to Benedict XI, seeking communion. Nothing came of this. And um, um, and part of what you know, probably prevented this possibly is the trend toward Latinization you saw earlier in the 13th century with uh, Innocent III, and I mentioned this in the last podcast, uh, earlier podcasts, about um, the churches, the Catholic Church's relationship with the Roman Church with the Maronites. Uh, this may have been part of what this uh, was about. Probably some concerns with the heresy on the part of the Romans, who didn't know that much, by the way. They had lost contact with these people, so they probably weren't that sure. The same process happens with the Maronites, happened with some of the other churches. The Jacobite Church, I mentioned in the last episode, uh, happens here. Oh, I f- one last thing to mention here as we get into this. Um, forgot to mention this. When we talk, I talk about the, the area where these Christians are uh, today, the reason why I'm treating it separately from uh, from other Eastern Christians is because it because it because of its historic nature. It it was birthed outside of the old Roman Empire. Uh, it's technically within the Ottoman Empire, as you'll see throughout most of the period we're talking about here. Um, however, um, parts of the territory in which they exist are fought over between the Ottoman Empire and the major uh, and the Safavid Empire, the Persian Empire, in the 16th and 17th centuries. And so there's some dispute over this for the period we're going to talk about here. I won't go into that in much detail. Uh, in terms of you know uh, union, there was a there was some union between these Christians briefly uh, and Rome in the 14th century in 1340. I mentioned there was a community on this island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. There was a brief union when the bishop of that island, Elias, uh, came into union with Rome in 1340. It did not last. Moreover, it goes back to this again, as we mentioned last time, in Union of Florence, the Council of Ferrara, Florence, saw the brief union of many Eastern churches with Rome in 1445, and that included Christians from Persia. Um, and that union did not last very long, like most of these didn't, but it had one lasting effect. Uh, it's at that, it's that, that council, in those documents, that they actually, the church actually coined the term Chaldean to describe those Eastern Christians who came into union with Rome, and in the 16th century, uh, Roman documents will actually use that term indiscriminately to describe all Eastern Christians, Maronites, every, everything else. But it's, a, it's, of course, a biblical term. It means something like magician or magi or something like that. So that's where you get that term from. Now, what happens to have communion come about again in a more permanent way, um, this goes back to the decline of the Assyrian Church of the East in the later Middle Ages, the invasion by the Mongols, and later on Tamerlane. Um, again, it, it led to um, you know uh, decline in the church. The missionary fervor of the early centuries was lost, and uh, crucially, in that region, there was no powerful Christian st- state to protect its interests. Again, this is the same thing, really, with the the Christians of the Ottoman Empire, where they sought the West out for a lot of reasons. All led to uh, this decline. 
And so for a long time, uh, the um, geographic area of the Assyrian Church of the East was so large that occasionally, in uh, in order to ensure stability, the patriarch would designate a successor from his own family. And so there became patriarchal lines. And this became standardized. It became a matter of, I guess, church law, as they understood it, after 1450, when patriarchs began, began naming their nephews as successors, or what they called, termed guardians of the throne. And this meant keeping the patriarch line in the same family. It also meant reducing the number of bishops who could be designated as metropolitans. And this is important because in the Church of the East, um, this comes out of the ancient world, uh, in their understanding of ecclesiology, I guess, only metropolitan bishops can consecrate the patriarch. So that by the time you get to the middle of the 16th century, there's only one left <laughs> uh, besides the patriarch himself. And that was an eight-year-old boy who was his successor. So this sort of nepotism combined with, of course, you, 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 know, you close the circle of people you draw from, it leads to less competence, led to a lot of criticism by the 1540s in the Assyrian Church of the East. And this led um, um, to uh, part of the Eastern Church seeking out Rome. Why? Because they wanted to, they wanted to have a patriarch in opposition to, uh, to this line that was being you know, monopolized by this one family. And so three bishops uh, from, from Iraq um, elected a new patriarch, a guy named Yohanan Sulaka. But he could not be consecrated, right? Because the only metropolitan was the eight-year-old successor of the current patriarch who they opposed. So the three bishops decided to reach out to the Bishop of Rome, who, I'll get to this in a second, how much, how much they knew about Rome at this point, because it had been so long and been separated by such a distance of time. They still knew he possessed that kind of authority. So they met first with the Franciscan missionaries in the Holy Land, who, who remember the last episode we talked about their influence. It was very great in the Middle East, right? Because they were the keeper of, of Latin holy sites, uh, some of them in the middle in uh, Jerusalem and elsewhere. And uh, went from there, and they proceeded to Rome. And in 1553, uh, uh, Sulaka, uh, who's the bishop-elected patriarch, makes it to Rome, makes his submission to Rome, and Pope Julius III proclaims a bull of union in February of that year. Now, again, how aware Sulaka was of Roman arguments for primacy for his universal jurisdiction are not quite clear. There's pretty clear there was some discussion of this uh, in the 13th century uh, when there was first contact during the Crusades. And again, certainly the, the Assyrian Church of the East was very aware Rome was one of the ancient seas of the church. They were aware of his, of his claims that uh, his um, authority derived from Peter. And there might have been, we're not really sure, some of the stuff I read mentions this, might have been some understanding that the Catholicos, that's what the patriarchs called in the Church of the East, um, is kind of similar to that of the Pope in the West, perhaps, uh, not quite the same way. But they, don't ha- they do not have a sort of conciliarist ecclesiology like the Byzantines do. And we know they didn't bother to, to ask them um, um, when they were seeking out you know, somebody to consecrate this bishop as patriarch. As for the Pope, he clearly wanted the same things from these from the uh, the Church of the East. He wanted from other Eastern Christians, one recognition recognition and extension of his practical jurisdiction to make good his claims on universal jurisdiction, wanted allies in missionary efforts in the region, and of course this was also further proof of the antiquity of Rome's authority in light of Reformation controversy. In fact, uh, Pope, uh, the Pope, actually, I don't think it was Pope Julius, but I think it was Pope Julius, perhaps, invited Sulaka to attend the Council of Trent, which was, actually, which was actually in session when he arrived in Rome, but he declined, citing the great distance he'd have to travel to get there. But this is the background for this union that's proclaimed in 1553, and to this day, the Chaldean Catholic Church will date its existence from this, this event. However, it's a long struggle to actually get there. Because what they do, of course, what this does, of course, um, Sulaka returns to Mesopotamia. He's, you know, he's feted by his people in the places where he's at. Uh, and in turn, he will consecrate several bishops, right? Part of the purpose of this was to have more metropolitans so they could do this to get it outside of one family. Um, he, by the way, he had uh, support. And this is, you know, 1555, uh, 1553 comes back. He has support from Dominican and Franciscan missionaries in the area of northern Iraq. So they're already there. The Latin missionaries have been there for a while. But this makes him the bitter enemy of the Assyrian uh, patriarch, Shimon uh, VII. 
for obvious reasons, and there's conflict over this. Um, Shimon the seventh actually invites Sulaka to meet with him, but when he does, he immediately imprisons him, tortures him for several months, and um, the Ottoman Pasha is informed of this, and this is they're in under the authority of the the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century. Um, he, he orders the Ottoman Pasha orders his death in 1555 by drowning. So it has a tragic end. The first patriarch of the Chaldean Catholic Church. There are, uh, by my count, let's see if I got the right count here, about six successors to Sulaka. Uh, the first, Abdisho the fourth, um, will make it to Rome and do his obeisance. He'll make it there during the latter stages of the Council of Trent, 15, 16, 1562. Uh, interestingly enough, his his likeness is actually memorialized in the Vatican. If you go today, the Salia Regia has a series of frescoes in there, a series of paintings. And there's a painting by Giuseppe Porta of a of, his, of an historical uh, event in the 12th century, but uh, scholars have figured out there's a there's a bearded figure with a turban uh, standing behind the Pope in that in that painting. That they think that's Abdi Show the Fourth. That whoever did this actually knew his likeness and used um, what was kind of a commonplace. Like pretty much all these these portrait painters in the 8th, 16th century didn't have a great idea of like cultural sensitivity, so they depicted all sorts of Eastern peoples, Muslims, Armenian Christians, as having turbans and beards, but they were pretty sure this is Abdisha IV. Right? If you look at the um, the image I use for the cover of this on my whatever, on, on Spotify, that, that that image is him, that's Abdisha IV. Um, uh, and his, uh, by the way, Abdisha IV, his profession of faith was actually translated into Latin by the prior of San Stefano, the Ethiopian church in Rome, we mentioned in the last episode. So again, he's part of this, this influx of Eastern Christians into Rome in the 16th century. And uh, his successors tried to keep in touch with Rome, but they, they found it very, very difficult to make it there. Uh, the reason being, and I'll mention this several times, is that um, I mentioned the Savafid Empire. Well, as the, especially when you get to the 17th century, they begin fighting wars with, uh, with the Ottoman Empire, and the territory in which they're, which they're based, northern Iraq, is, is disputed, and there's, there's warfare between both sides. That's why it becomes very hard to maintain relations with Rome. In, the 16, in 1653, uh, Shimon the, uh, the 11th, which I believe is, you translate that, translate that into English as Simeon, but it's Shimon, we'll call him Shimon the 11th, patriarch of the Chaldean Catholic Church, actually sends a letter to Innocent X, um, you know, proclaiming his loyalty to him and proclaiming that there are, quote, 40,000 families, unquote, loyal to him among his flock. Um, however, this, this relationship between the successors of Sulaka will actually come to an end in the 1670s because of some of these difficulties in communication, partly um, because um, they because of these the warfare I mentioned, but also because the Chaldean patriarch residents, they kept moving around northern Mesopotamia, partly to avoid the fighting, but also partly to avoid confrontation with the Assyrian patriarch. Um, and the reason why is the Assyrian patriarch of the East has more legitimacy than they do. That's, the pro- that's part of the problem. Um, they're aware of that, the Ottomans are, after shortly after all this breaks out, and initially in the 1550s, partly because of sporadic Ottoman persecution on that basis. And so you have those problems. And partly because, again, did, I'm not sure, I couldn't find out exactly, but Rome becomes more and more aware of the situation, historically speaking, of these Assyri- of the Church of the East. And they begin coming, making, having their own contacts with the Assyrian Patriarch of the East, now centered in Mosul, um, centered in Mosul, where his church is, and there are several attempts uh, back and forth to enter into communion. But again, they flounder as, as a result of the main stumbling block, that of loyalty to Nestorius and his teachings. The last uh, patriarch descends from Sulaka uh, is a guy named Shimon the Thirteenth or Simeon the Thirteenth, who's the last patriarch of his line. He will send letters uh, to Clement the Tenth. Uh, in 1670, imploring that Chaldeans be allowed to retain their ancient liturgical and ecclesiastical customs. So I don't know if that means at that point, I couldn't find out, that there are Latin missionaries who are probably uh, maybe insisting upon this stuff. This also happens, by the way, in the 18th century, because you do have, if you recall a couple of episodes before, I mentioned the uh, the uh, letter of Benedict XIV, a latte sunt. Uh, it's partly about this, partly about Eastern Christians, um, Chaldean Catholic Christians in, in northern Iraq. That's what was the basis of that letter. 
Um, but interestingly enough, there's also pushback from his own community, from the Chaldean Catholic community itself, um, about the relationship with Rome, I guess. Uh, and again, one of the things they were worried about in, in the, the, uh, the Chaldean Catholic Church is that Roman issued a bull in 1654 that made the local Latin patriarch, um, gave him jurisdiction over all Eastern Christians and wherever he was at in his territory, regardless of rank. And it appears that this subordination of the community to Rome, as if it derived its authority solely from Rome, was a sticking point. And again, I don't know how much Rome practically insists upon this, but it was a theoretical claim they were making which, by the way, is not accurate. <laughs> they did not, they, they, that church was not, never created by Rome. Again, its, its antiquity is, is, is large. And I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure there were popes who knew this was not the case, but uh, I don't know that for a fact. However, by 1672, uh, Simeon XIII, the Chaldean patriarch, had had enough. He goes back into communion with the Assyrian Church of the East and leaves those Chaldeans who were still more or less in communion with Rome without a leader, and what happens is you begin to have, you have another person uh, step forward, take his place. And I need to emphasize, by the way, from the 1670s onward, the role of Latin missionaries. It's very crucial in keeping contact with these communities. Uh, in particular, the Capuchin Franciscans. Uh, they, will, they will consolidate their house. They have a house uh, in Mosul, in the seat of the Assyrian Church of the East in the, from the 1670s onward. And they'll play a key role in all this, in supporting the Chaldean Church of the East. They, um, um, some more, um, in 1670, uh, Joseph, the Metropolitan Amid, a city in northern Iraq, uh, sends a letter to, to, to the Pope in 1670, uh, making his submission to Rome. He accepts, um, more pretty clearly, I think, than his successors, Tridentine notions of, of, of Roman jurisdiction, as well as Roman Christology. And from, uh, 1672 begins sort of, you know, ministering to, um, Chaldean communities outside of his diocese in 1672. By 1677, the Ottoman government has basically acknowledged him as the leader of the Chaldean uh, Catholic community there, despite opposition from the Assyrian Patriarch of the, Patriarch of the, East, Patriarch of the East. And in 1681, Rome finally recognizes the Patriarch of, uh, him as Patriarch of, well, I should get this, this is actually an important point. They recognize him, quote, and this is a translation of the, of the Latin title he's given, as Patriarch of the Chaldean Patriarch deprived of its Patriarch, pa pa excuse me, pa uh, Patriarch of the Chaldeans deprived, uh, I guess it's Patriarch of the Chaldean Church, deprived of its Patriarch. In other words, they're reserving the, chi the title of Patriarch of the Chaldean Church or Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East to the Assyrian Church of the Patriarch of the East. That's confusing. They're reser reserving it for the, uh, the Patriarch who's not in communion with them, which even though they recognize Joseph, uh, it appeared to have to them by this point to have more legitimacy and with hopes of Rome, you know, still hoping to bring them into communion with them. And the reason why they have more legitimacy is, of course, they have more antiquity and they have a direct line back to the ancient world. Again, that was a consideration too. Antiquity and, and orthodoxy, those two things, were usually foremost on Rome's mind. And that's why, if you wanted to, if you wanted to criticize Rome for this, they, they tended to see the Chaldeans as sort of a right. They have a right, and they're Christians who have a right, but they don't see them as having their own church. They, they don't recognize them. They recognize the Assyrian patriarch as having his own. Now, I should say, by the way, that this is, this is partly because, really, they're not big enough, really, to have their own church in a lot of ways. It's a small, fledgling community. Really, it's only in the 19th century that the, uh, the Chaldean Catholic Church kind of comes into its own um, uh, as a, a, a real strong self-identification as a church in that way anyway. But another thing happens with Joseph that's very important is that, despite all this, uh, Joseph uh, and his successors, Joseph II and Joseph III, would encourage um, Latinization of the Chaldean uh, Catholics in communion with Rome, the acceptance not only of Tridentine, Tridentine jurisdictional claims, but also Latin liturgical and devotional customs, um, um, encouraging things like the praying of the rosary. Uh, Joseph II, for example, um, was one of the first of these patriarchs to emphasize in terms of sacramental theology the distinction between venial and mortal sins, something that seemed to have never been emphasized in the Church of the East before and, and among these Christians. And this partly comes about because, and I'm not, uh, there's not much, too much to say for the rest of the, the uh, most of the 18th century, uh, 
except that you had, you know, that contact uh, that led to a latte sunt. But you had more and more frequent visits to Rome by Chaldean patriarchs and by Chaldean clergy, probably because they now had the recognition of the Ottomans as being legitimate, you know, heads of Christian communities. Uh, talked about this a little bit in the last episode about how the Ottomans treated people under their authority. It had to do with, they treated them as sort of like um, their subject religious bodies, but they're re officially recognized heads. And so they have an official place within Ottoman law and stuff like that. Probably one of the reasons why. Uh, Rome, um, despite receiving these patriarchs and you know, confirming them, they still kept communications open with the Assyrian patriarch of the East in Mosul. And just the fact that the Chaldean community lacked that legitimacy and their numbers compared to it throughout the 18th century meant it was kind of an tenuous situation. Um, probably exacerbated to a certain extent by, by the amount of time that several of these patriarchs spent in Rome because it reduced its presence in Mesopotamia. It couldn't make converts, it couldn't, you know, um, you can't convince people if you're not on the ground there. Um, however, um, the, um, this policy of these patriarchs to seek close ties with Rome, to keep in contact with Rome, uh, probably ensured its survival in the long run, which I mentioned before, um, is confirmed in the 19th century. That's really more when the Chaldean Catholic Church comes into its own. Um, and that is it. That is it for this, uh, this episode on the Church of the East and the creation of the Chaldean Catholic Church. Um, next time, and this is very much related to this, we're going to talk about the episode of the, um, well, with the St. Thomas Christians. We'll have to go back and talk about that as well. But the, um, the Church of India uh, and this is the well, second to last episode. We're almost done with the early modern period. Can you imagine? I started this thing like a year ago. I thought I was going to be done with it in like three episodes. Oh, what a, what a dumb person I am. Uh, no, um, next episode will be about probably the biggest episode of Latinization, the most disastrous consequences, because if you pay attention to the news, there is ongoing a real serious possibility of schism in the Syro Malabar Rite, uh, which is a church in communion with Rome, and it's directly related to events in the 16th century because you're going to see Roman attempts to bring these Thomas Christians back into communion with Rome. They've been separated for a long time. Will lead to a, a permanent split within the Church of India. So um, that's what we'll for next time. Uh, that is all. A couple of things, uh, housekeeping notes. Again, haven't reached out to people about interviews. But there'll be interviews for my patrons. You'll get in that stuff. You'll also be getting probably another bonus episode uh, sooner rather than later. And then uh, a couple other things. I'll be doing more stuff again, reading more stuff from my blog um, uh, going forward, probably especially as this, the school semester uh, starts up. It's already started at my, uh, at my institution or will start actually tomorrow, I think. I don't start uh, work. I start later. My classes start later. But definitely by the middle of September, things will slow down in terms of content. I'll still try to have at least a couple episodes a month up. Um, one way or the other but just FYI on that and that is all for this episode of Controversies in Church History remember you can find Controversies in Church History on the web at churchcontroversies.com you can find us on social media on Twitter Facebook, YouTube as well as on Patreon if you would like to come to Patreon and uh, express your support for the podcast I think it's like 5, 7, 10 bucks a month something like that as a donation you can make uh, if you'd like to do that not a big deal um, thank you once again to all of the listeners. I really appreciate it. Uh, it confirms to me what I'm doing. I really thank you guys for that. And uh, more than becoming a patron, spread the word about the podcast. If you like it, share it on social media. Tag me in it on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, send nice messages. Say nice things. <laughs> Help spread the word is probably the most important thing you can do. But bless you all. God bless you to all my listeners. And definitely God bless my patrons. Um, definitely appreciate um, what you do for me. And um, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Uh, God, God bless you all and take care. You'll hear hearing from me soon.